Take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth. Hey! Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. <laughs> CannabisRadio.com presents The Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Hey, this is great, man. We love it. Now, here's your host, Radical Russ Belleville. Oh, yes. Good day, tokers and tokettes and non-token lovers of liberty. It is Monday, December 14, 2015, and it's got to be 420 somewhere in the world. Yes. Thank you for being here. Thanks for the applause. We love that. It's our final week of shows here for 2015. We're taking the holiday break starting next week, so this is it. This uh, last week of shows, and we've got a good last week of shows for you as we look forward to 2016 and the possibility of five states legalizing marijuana. That's right, California, Nevada, Arizona, Massachusetts, and Maine. And over the next five days, I'm going to spend the Radical Rant each day talking about one of those states. So today we're going to dig into California, the Adult Use of Marijuana Act, the so-called Sean Parker Initiative looks well on its way to making the ballot. There are other initiatives out there, and it's too soon to say that they won't make the ballot, but chances are pretty good for the Sean Parker one just because it has a shit ton of money, which is what you need to be able to get on the ballot and pass in the state of California. Then uh, tomorrow we'll talk about Nevada. Uh, on uh, Wednesday we'll get Arizona. Thursday we'll get Massachusetts. Friday we will get into Maine. And on Friday, our guest on the show will be Mason Tavert from the Marijuana Policy Project. They're behind four out of five of those states. All of them but California are initiatives that the MPP are bankrolling, and three of those four were initiatives that MPP wrote. So we'll talk to Mason about some of the peculiarities in some of those initiatives. That's coming up on Friday. Coming up today, though, of course, it's Monday, and that means it's time for our regular dose of cannabis science with Dr. Mitch Earlywine. He'll get the cannabis Q&A going right at 3.30 Pacific time, coming up at the bottom of the hour. Uh, he'll answer your live questions at 971-533-7111. That's our studio number, 971-533-7111. We're going to talk to Dr. Mitch about studies that show marijuana helps reduce obesity, helps treat epilepsy, might fight liver cancer, and work against dermatomyositis. Whatever the hell that is. Uh, plus, we'll talk about some of the reefer madness out there about skunk weed that's being uh, promoted out there in some of the media. Also coming up on the show today, we'll have a chance to do some drug war data mining. And today, we're taking a look at drug testing rates among employers in the medical marijuana states versus the recreational marijuana states. And uh, some very disturbing numbers coming out of the drug war data mines. We've also got Behind the Headlines coming up right after the news. Uh, and in Behind the Headlines, we're going to do another, oh no, I'm so sad about this stupid stoner story that we've got to get to, a uh, stupid prohibition story, I should say, because it's the prohibitions that's stupid, not the people who are violating them. But, um, you know, folks, it's still illegal uh, in a lot of places. And so you need to be a little smarter when it comes to how and where you're going to enjoy your marijuana. We'll talk about a terrible story coming out of, I think this was in New York. So uh, we'll get to that in our stupid prohibition stories. That comes right after our cannabis radio news headlines, courtesy of the Associated Press. And in the headlines today, we've got the possibility of a sixth state legalizing in 2016. We'll tell you which one. Michigan Supreme Court lets Grand Rapids decrim stand. We've got another recall in Denver. Palm Beach, Florida is looking at decrim. The Emerald Cup had a great weekend this weekend. And High Times is set to give its first ever Trailblazer Award this weekend or this week at the High Times Business Summit, we'll tell you who the honoree is. All that and more coming up on the Russ Bellville Show, including our two Toker Talk Radio. We'll take your calls at 971-533-7111. We'll talk about white folks, token in New York City, and other stories, plus your calls in hour two. It's the Russ Bellville Show, live every weekday, right now on Cannabis Radio. This is the Russ Bellville Show on CannabisRadio.com.
the son of a Polish immigrant who grew up in a Brooklyn tenement. He went to public schools, then college, where the work of his life began, fighting injustice and inequality, speaking truth to power. He moved to Vermont, won election and praise as one of America's best mayors. In Congress, he stood up for working families and for principle, opposing the Iraq war, supporting veterans. Now he's taking on Wall Street and a corrupt political system, funded by over a million contributions, tackling climate change to create clean energy jobs, fighting for living wages, equal pay, and tuition-free public colleges. People are sick and tired of establishment politics, and they want real change. Bernie Sanders, husband, father, grandfather, an honest leader, building a movement with you to give us a future to believe in. I'm Bernie Sanders, and I approve this message. Dr. Dagger, hurry! Its temperature is shooting past 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It's burning up! I'm afraid for this little guy, it's just too late. What caused the problem? Only Dr. Dabber can maintain the perfect temperature for a smooth-tasting, slower burn. This standard vaporizer lost all of its health benefits, sending it up in smoke. So you're telling me that most vapor pens burn so hot they produce smoke, not vapor? Correct! Keep away from those standard vaporizer pens and turn to Dr. Dabber, doctor's orders. Less heat, <laughs> more flavor. It's time for the Cannabis Radio News. Covering the latest headlines in consumer cannabis, medical marijuana, and industrial hemp. Cannabis Radio News is now available exclusively at CannabisRadio.com. Now your marijuana headlines in 4 minutes and 20 seconds. This is Cannabis Radio News. This is your Cannabis Radio News for Monday, December 14th, 2015. Vermonters over age 21 would be able to legally grow and use marijuana starting in July 2016 and could start buying the drug for recreational use in stores and lounges a year later under a bill that Senator Jeanette White will introduce next month. Senate committees are expected to work on the legislation next month, though political leaders have made clear there's no guarantee legalization will pass in 2016. White's committee has been meeting throughout the summer and fall to discuss how to go about legalizing marijuana in Vermont. What White came up with is a 41-page bill she is sponsoring herself as committee members lacked consensus on the issue. No more than 84 stores would be permitted to sell up to one ounce to Vermonters and one quarter ounce to out-of-staters. As many as 42 lounges would be permitted to sell up to one quarter ounce for on-premise consumption, much like bars now serve alcohol. The Michigan Supreme Court has let stand an amendment to the Grand Rapids City Charter that decriminalizes marijuana. The amendment was approved by Grand Rapids voters in 2012. It makes possession of or sharing marijuana a civil infraction punishable by fines ranging from $25 to $100 with no jail time. It also makes marijuana cases a low police priority and forbids city law enforcement officials from referring marijuana cases to the Kent County Prosecutor's Office. That caught the attention of longtime Kent County Prosecutor William Forsyth. He challenged the amendment as an illegal restriction on his power to enforce state drug laws, which continue to make marijuana possession a crime. He lost in Kent County Circuit Court and the Michigan Court of Appeals, and then took his appeal to the Michigan Supreme Court, which refused to hear the case. Denver marijuana business Advanced Medical Alternatives is voluntarily recalling 27 cartridges of its THC-infused vape pen oil because they contain potentially dangerous pesticides that cannot legally be used on cannabis in Colorado. The recall is Advanced Medical Alternatives' second in eight days and the 13th recall issued by the City of Denver's Department of Environmental Health in 13 weeks. Advanced Medical Alternatives isn't the only Colorado marijuana company to have been recalled multiple times. Edibles company Edipure has issued three voluntary recalls. Gaia's Garden, also an edibles maker, voluntarily recalled product twice. The Palm Beach County, Florida Commission is set to ease the penalty for carrying small amounts of marijuana within the county. A public hearing will be held Tuesday on an ordinance to change the penalty for possession of less than 20 grams of marijuana from a trip to jail to a $100 civil citation, similar to a traffic ticket. 20 grams is about three quarters of an ounce. Stiffer penalties would still apply to those caught dealing the drug or possessing large quantities. 
Between 2010 and 2014, police in Palm Beach County initiated 7,571 cases where the most serious offense was possession of less than 20 grams of marijuana, and about 90% resulted in a booking at the jail. Other communities have reduced the penalty for marijuana possession, including Miami-Dade County, West Palm Beach, and Broward County. The Emerald Cup, the celebration of cannabis culture now in its third year in Santa Rosa, California, wrapped up its two-day run at the Sonoma County Fairgrounds on Sunday with its biggest attendance ever, showcasing some of the best outdoor organic marijuana in the world and the industry the plant has spawned. The weekend event drew more than 21,000 people, according to organizer Tim Blake, compared to 13,000 last year and 7,000 in 2013. Senator Bernie Sanders, the independent from Vermont running for the Democratic nomination for president, will receive an award from marijuana activists Monday evening for his efforts to legalize the drug. The Democratic presidential candidate will be honored at the High Times Business Summit in Washington, D.C. with the group's first ever Trailblazer Award. Sanders, a self-described Democratic socialist, is backing legislation that would end the longtime federal prohibition on marijuana. The ending Federal Marijuana Prohibition Act introduced last month by Senator Sanders would remove barriers for the states that want to legalize recreational and medical marijuana without interference from the federal government. However, other states could still choose to prohibit pot. This has been your Cannabis Radio News for Monday, December 14th, 2015. I'm Russ Belville. Imagine life without taxes. Let New Era Certified Public Accountants, NewEraCPAs.com, handle your Cannabis 280E and tax strategy. Get your business prepared with New Era CPAs Cannabis Finance Boot Camp. NewEraCPAs.com, with years of experience in the industry, we are one of the nation's leading accounting firms for growers, dispensaries, and ancillary companies from Washington to California. NewEraCPAs.com. The Russ Belleville Show on CannabisRadio.com, the national wildlife refuge for marijuana unicorns. Gondrepreneur.com, your guide to the cannabis business world. Gondrepreneur.com is a comprehensive resource for cannabis professionals and entrepreneurs. Download the Gondrepreneur app on your smartphone or tablet to catch up on cannabis industry news, scroll through our daily job listings, and learn about successful cannabis companies, executives, and investors. Gondrepreneur.com, helping Gondrepreneurs grow. Stupid Prohibition Stories. As a public service, the Russ Belleville Show reminds you that smoking marijuana does not make one stupid. However, some stupid people do smoke marijuana, and Prohibition is always waiting for another victim. Learn your lesson from today's Stupid Prohibition Stories. With your Stupid Prohibition Stories, I'm old-timey 1920s radio reporter Freddie Farrakh. This just in from CBS News. New York man caught smoking pot in cop's parking spot. Clifton Park, New York. State police say a 22-year-old upstate New York man picked the wrong parking spot to smoke marijuana. Troopers say Ryan Law of Gansevoort, New York, was scheduled to attend a victim impact panel Tuesday at the town court in Clifton Park, an Albany suburb. The court is housed in the same building as the state police barracks. Police say Law parked his car in front of the barracks in a parking spot marked Police Cars Only. A uniformed trooper unloading his patrol car nearby spotted Law and approached him to discuss his choice of parking spots. That's when the trooper smelled marijuana coming from Law's vehicle. Troops say they found about 30 grams of pot in the car. Law was ticketed for marijuana possession and ordered to appear at the same court next week. I'm Freddy Farrakh with your stupid... Prohibition Story! <laughs> okay. That's not too bright. Um, mistake number one. Smoke and pot in your car. It's just the wrong thing to do, folks. And look, I'm not innocent in this regard. <laughs> I've done it many a time. 
but it is the riskiest place on the planet to smoke pot. Your car. And even if you found some place that's off to the side somewhere where you can't be seen, like you're not dumb enough to actually park in a cop's parking spot, you're still filling up your car with the smell of pot smoke. And you're opening up the chance that you miss an ash or a seed or a fleck or a stem or something in your car that later ends up being used to bust you. If I could just, if I could get every toker on the planet to stop smoking pot in their cars, we would kill the arrest rate by about two thirds. That's just a guess, but I think we can kill about two thirds of the marijuana arrest if we just stop smoking in the cars. But young men do dumb things sometimes, even when pot's not involved. I, I have a good friend from high school, <laughs> Ricky, and that's his given legal name, Ricky. <laughs> Uh, it's on the birth certificate, I swear to God. And uh, Ricky, one time, uh, I remember, got busted for some sort of... Oh, yeah, it was like driving without a license or something. He had a suspended license. And so he had to go to court for that. And so he drove to court. That's right, he drove to court for his driving on a suspended license. And so he went to court, and the cop who was there for the court case, you know, testified for whatever the case was, and... The case was over and Ricky goes back to his car. The cop who was just in court comes out of the courthouse and sees Ricky getting into his car and driving away. So the cop chases Ricky down a couple blocks down, pulls him over, puts him in the back of the car, takes him back to court, brings him back in front of the judge who he had just left. <laughs> I mean, the judge's docket wasn't even done yet. <laughs> And uh, yeah, she threw the book at him. I think he had a—he didn't have a license for a couple years or something after that. But <laughs> and that's not even with any marijuana involved, folks. We got to be smarter <laughs> when we're dealing with the system and the man. So, number one, don't smoke pot in your car. Number two, don't smoke pot in your car when you're on your way to court. And number three, don't smoke pot in your car on the way to court in the police parking spot. I don't know how much clearer we can make this. <laughs> Again, remember, smoking marijuana does not make you stupid, but some stupid people do smoke marijuana. Let's hope that uh, Ryan Law, and what an ironic last name, Law. <laughs> Let's hope that Ryan Law of Gansevoort, New York, has a good lawyer and that this doesn't impact his life too dramatically. You know, there are times where I've fallen off the wagon. Nobody would blame you if you did, Mr. President. With what you've had to go through in your two terms, we wouldn't blame you a bit if you rejoined the Choom Gang from time to time. All right, folks, it's 420 in the Mountain Time Zone. Happy 420 to my brother, Matt. Stay strong, little brother. Everything's going to be all right. Russ Belville Show is proudly sponsored by the Marijuana Business Association. The MJBA, called by NBC News the Cannabis Chamber of Commerce, is the fastest growing business association in the fastest growing industry in America. I've been working with the MJBA for years and I personally invite you to join the MJBA. MJBA also publishes the popular MJ Headline News on Facebook and the MJNewsNetwork.com and Marijuana Channel One on YouTube. Visit MJBA.net for more details. The Russ Belleville Show reminds you to never smoke and drive impaired. Hang out for a while and share. Your connection to quality cannabis insurance services is spelled K-A-E-R-C-H-E-R. -E -E That's Karcher Insurance. We have worked with ventures like cannabis for over 60 years. We're proud to represent over 50 companies with tailor-made cannabis business plans for owners just like you to insure your product, your plants, and your pursuits. K-A-E-R-C-H-E-R -E spells out their full-service insurance services ranging from commercial 
commercial to bonds to personal from life to health and more. Contact the team at KarcherInsurance.com and let our experience work for you. That's K-A-E-R-C-H-E-R Insurance.com. Contact Karen and the team at Karcher Insurance at 1-844-421-3560. That's 844-421-3560. Arguing for the end of adult marijuana prohibition is easy because we have facts, science, reason, compassion, evidence, truth, and logic on our side. It is even easier when researchers catalog it all for us. Learn how to gather the facts on marijuana use, arrests, seizures, rehabs, drug tests, and more in this edition of Drug War Data Mining. Welcome back, everyone. Today in the Drug War Data Mines, we take a look at a survey released just today by the Society for Human Resources Management. And let me always start by saying how much I hate the term human resources. We used to be called personnel, you know, person was part of who we are. Now we're just resources. Anyway, uh, the Society for Human Resources has released a study, a survey actually, where they asked employers in the 19 states that have medical marijuana laws and the four states that have both medical and recreational marijuana laws, what their workplace drug testing policies were all about. And unfortunately, this survey uncovers Uh, an unintended consequence of marijuana legalization that might be harming medical marijuana patients. Uh, According to the survey, in the legal marijuana states, 82% of employers say marijuana use at work is not permitted for any reason. Now, keep in mind when, when they phrase that as marijuana use at work, They're not talking about people smoking joints while they're sitting at the desk, you know, uh, filing the TPS reports or whatever. They're talking about whether or not you would piss hot on a on a piss test. That's all. Yeah. Marijuana use by them just means that you use marijuana at any time and we might catch you on a pee test at the workplace. Right. So 82 percent of the employers in the legal marijuana states, four out of five. Say that you can't be a pot smoker. But if you look at the medical only states, it's only 73%, three out of four. So did legalizing marijuana in Oregon, Alaska, Washington, and Colorado cause those employers to get stricter on marijuana use and thereby harm the employment rights of medical marijuana consumers? In the medical marijuana states, according to the survey, 22% of employers have exceptions for medical cannabis use in their drug policies. But in the legal states, only 11% of employers have such medical exceptions. So you're twice as likely, or you're half as likely, I should say, to get a medical marijuana exception if your state has passed recreational marijuana, at least according to this survey. Now, most of the respondents said their drug policies existed prior to legalization and haven't made any changes, but 29% of respondents in the recreational states and 16% in the medical states say they've modified their policies. So three out of 10 employers in the recreational states changed their drug policy when legalization came about. 16% in the medical marijuana states changed their policy. And of the people or of the employers who have changed their policies, 37% have made their drug policies more restrictive. Wow. So if we've got 29% in the recreational states saying they modified their policies, three out of 10, and of those three out of 10 that changed their policies, 37% made them more restrictive, what we're working that at, what that works out to be is that legalization of marijuana caused one out of 10 employers to make their workplace drug policies more restrictive. 12% said they made their policies less restrictive. So passing legalization in a medical marijuana state meant it was three times more likely that the drug policy would get more restrictive than less restrictive. Now, as we look at... uh, the, the states and looking forward, 
5% of the companies in states where only medical marijuana is legal said they plan to make their policies more restrictive in the next year. And another 5% said they plan to make them more accommodating. 69% said they don't plan to change their policies at all. And when it comes to trying to get a job, don't think that just because marijuana is legal or you have a medical marijuana card that you're going to, that you're free from discrimination. Now, the new states, the the California, Massachusetts, uh, Maine, Arizona, and Nevada, and perhaps Vermont, some of those states do have some workplace protections. But in the medical marijuana states, 32% of the employers say they don't they will not hire marijuana users. That's right. In the medical marijuana states, almost a third of the employers won't hire medical marijuana users. And in the recreational states, it's 38% that won't hire marijuana users. That's two out of five employers in legal marijuana states that will not hire you for enjoying your legal right to use marijuana. Now, it does depend for some of them, for 10% of the respondents in the medical states and 7% in the recreational states, they said it does depend on the position, right? So for some of these, a minority of them, maybe they're just testing you if you're going to be, you know, on the forklift or, you know, driving the company car. But if you're just answering phones, maybe not. This area, employment protection, the right to work for marijuana consumers is the next big fight in the marijuana legalization arena and in the arena of drug users' civil rights in general. It's time that we begin this fight and we can only win this fight by educating these employers that what they're doing doesn't work. It doesn't stop marijuana users from working for you. It just forces them to beat P-tests, which is quite easy if you know what you're doing. So not only does it not work, but it also discourages some of the best potential employees from even applying to work for you. Workplaces without P-testing have much higher levels of job satisfaction than places that P-test. It's counterproductive, it costs you money, and it does not work. And frankly, it's anti-American to deny employment for people who are just law-abiding citizens. This is the Russ Belleville Show on CannabisRadio.com. At Herbie's Cannabis Seeds, we pride ourselves on bringing you the best quality seeds from the world's most respected cannabis seed producers, all at the lowest online prices. You can find Herbie's Seeds at Herbie'sHeadShop.com. All cannabis seeds are sold as souvenirs and as a means of preserving cannabis genetics. Herbie Seeds in no way intends to condone, promote, or incite the use of illegal or controlled substances. We strongly urge all prospective customers to check their national laws prior to placing an order. Herbie's Seeds at Herbie'sHeadShop.com. Proud sponsors of The Russ Belville Show and 420 Radio. You're listening to the Russ Belleville Show on CannabisRadio.com, where we don't change our mind on decriminalization during an election year. MJWellness.com, the largest medical marijuana community in the world. Connect with thousands of patients, doctors, industry leaders, and businesses through shared personal experiences along our worldwide network. Discover new therapies and benefits with content tailored to you. Come grow your network on mjwellness.com. You're not alone. Your wellness matters. Learn, live, and thrive. Check out mjwellness.com today. It's time for the Russ Belleville Show's Cannabis Q&A with Dr. Mitch Earlywine. Dr. Early Wine is a professor of psychology at the State University of New York at Albany and a leading author and researcher on cannabinoids and health who pins the Ask Dr. Mitch column for High Times Magazine. Get your questions ready in our live chat or call in to 971-533-7111 now. Welcome back, everybody. We're glad to have the host of Burning Issues, the podcast here on CannabisRadio.com, joining us. He's also the chair of the Normal Board of Directors. It's Dr. Mitch. How you doing, Dr. Mitch? 
Much better than last week. Yeah, glad to hear it. And, uh, well, I hope you had a good holiday otherwise. Indeed. Monica was uh, unparalleled. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Uh, we've got the phone lines open at 971-533-7111. If you've got any questions on cannabis science, culture, history, or health, Dr. Mitch is here to answer the questions. But uh, I've got a few questions that we've built up from the past couple of weeks of marijuana studies that have been in the news. Let's start with this one on obesity, Dr. Mitch. Uh, according to the Washington Post, legalizing medical marijuana could help reduce obesity. How does that work? It's wild because we've seen these correlational things for uh, pretty much ever since you and I started doing the podcast together here, where, yeah, cannabis users tend to weigh just a little less than folks who are non-users, despite the stereotype about the munchies. But now we have new data where, you know, places that have changed their medical marijuana laws are suddenly showing these small but statistically significant changes in levels of obesity in that, you know, 4 to 6% range. And the mechanisms are kind of intriguing to guess, but one idea might be that folks with pain are being, you know, treated well and capable of exercising a little more, or just uh, people are generally happier and less uh, reliant on stuffing their faces in order to change their mood. So it's been intriguing, but this, I feel like, is stronger evidence than the simple correlational stuff we had in the past. It's time to randomly assign smoke to uh, assign folks to smoke cannabis or <laughs> see who ends up heavy. Well, I'll be glad to be one of those random assignees. I've been uh, undertaking the task for the past 25 years now, so <laughs> we'll see how that works out. I hate to think of how fat I'd be without pot, Dr. Mitch. That's <laughs> a sad thought. Yes, I know. All right. Uh, among other things that marijuana seems to be helping, a large scale test on marijuana extracts and children with epilepsy. They they talked about this on NPR, so it's definitely breaking through to the mainstream. Anything we didn't already know? Did they find some new stuff out here? Pretty much just now we've got literally the biggest sample ever. So over 200 kids were involved in this study, and it's becoming clearly unconscionable to withhold CBD for children with epilepsy anymore. This is markedly better than a lot of the epilepsy drugs that were approved back in the day. So I feel like this this is uh, this has got to happen now. There's 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 no ethical way to say that we can't have CBD for children with epilepsy. Now, were these studies this largest study? Uh, was it using plant CBD or was it like Epidiolex, one of the the GDB pharma uh, preparations? Oh, it's interesting because they, they've got uh, a couple hundred of them here, and I thought they had to go with the with the synthetic, with the you know, with the prescribable. It wasn't actually plant extract. So the uh, clincher is, I mean, CBD is CBD. I, I don't feel like there's that opportunity for the entourage effect that we would like to see. But now some doctors are saying, look, if we had cannabidiol and THC. We might have a chance to, to do even better. I feel like there's still a lot of resistance to that, as you might uh, guess. And, uh, you know, it's much better than those benzodiazepines or the barbiturates that are just so sedating and the kids are, you know, lethargic and, and wrecked. And it's just, it seems like this is the way to go. Yeah, it, it always strikes me as the height of odd and and unnecessary to worry about whether or not a kid's going to get some euphoria off of THC when we're loading them up on Adderall and benzos. <laughs> Just... Exactly, and, and I mean literally the old barbiturates, like the you know the potentially lethal, horrible ones from back in the day, are used for these guys sometimes. And it, you know, yeah, they don't seize, but they also don't walk around as much as they could. You know, so no, this is this is definitely a, a good uh, sign for progress. All right. We have a story from uh, newsmedical.net about the liver's cannabinoid receptors could be targeted to combat liver cancer. So is this not actually targeting the cancer, but targeting the, the, the receptor they're talking about? This is, this is a little wild because the CD1 receptor actually needs to be blockaded in certain forms of basically uh, lipid, like sort of fat metabolism in the liver. And so it's it's not what we usually think of as, oh, you know, add some THC and everything's going to be fine. This is actually trying to shut those down. And we know that the drugs that shut down the CB1 receptor make people super depressed and even suicidal. So I'm, I'm apprehensive about making too much of this until we can find a way to sort of do it in a, an ethically undepressing sort of technique. But 
it really underlies the fact that, hey, liver cancer and the cannabinoid system are clearly connected, and thank God for cannabis and cannabis research, or we never really would have even uh, identified this. Mm. And that, of course, uh, leads me to a personal question. Uh, my brother, 45 years old, in the peak of health, uh, a weightlifter, eats organically, runs triathlons, just got diagnosed with colon cancer. They're going to have to remove a, a softball-sized mass and a piece of his colon. And I'm wondering what you can tell me about any uh, research on colon cancer specifically in cannabis, and what are the, the, the prognosis on treating colon cancer? It's very sensitive and depends on whether or not the mass has sort of reached outside the, the colon itself. And it's my dad had it, who's you know twice your brother's age, and the, the mass hadn't reached all the way to the outside of the colon, and now he's fine. But if there is that chance of spreading, that's the thing that drives everybody bananas, of course. Now, obviously, you know, the, the chance to handle uh, the, the hardcore surgery like that, he's going to need, you know, everything he can to make sure his immune function is best. And he needs to give himself plenty of time and plenty of opportunities to relax and stay mellow in, in the recovery period. Um, but this is, you know, clearly too big to, like, just hope for and I'm sure we'll all get nasty emails about this, just an extract. Like, this is this is way too far along mm-hmm. for anything other than a surgical intervention. Yeah, yeah, and uh, we'll know more. He's going into a surger- surgery consult today, and uh, we should know more about that. They're going to, they did the scans, and they did not find any spread to the liver, which is fantastic news. I, I, Absolutely. Yeah, I think they're also going to be taking a look at an, a lymph node while they're in there, uh, just to determine whether or not there's a spread there, but... Uh, as far as, you know, when you hear your brother's got a softball-sized mass in his ass, the news I'm getting is at least the best you can hope for. Yeah, I'm so sorry, man. It, it's really rough, and my, my heart's out to him and out to your whole family. Yeah, yeah. I, it, we'll fight this. It'll be all right. And, uh, you know, there's got to be some reason why I've been, you know, one of the most educated people on this subject on the planet. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping I can help. Uh, let's get to our final uh, question here. Uh on and I don't even know what this is referring to, to tell you the truth, but dermatomyositis and a cannabinoid that can suppress. And now it's lost me because it's got a bunch of Greek letters and stuff going on. What, what's the sure, story? But about? Basically, <laughs> basically, these are, are uh, certain components of uh, this dermatological problem. It's basically it's it's kind of harsh to look at, but it's skin and muscle that have had these oddball inflammations and growths on them. It looks like a, a horrible burn sometimes. Mm. And what's odd is this is uh, agilimic acid. This is one of the uh, synthetic cannabinoids that we don't hear about much, in part because it's not psychoactive and it doesn't really even mimic some of the ones we're accustomed to seeing, but it's got a, a reasonable uh, set of research supporting it for neuropathic pain and other sort of inflammatory-related disorders and seems to really uh, have the potential to activate that CB2 receptor. And it's intriguing because this isn't your stereotypical um, autoimmune kind of problem. So it's it's got the opportunity for uh, your skin to really improve. And it looks like the uh, the muscle tissue even to regenerate. But, you know, we're in early stages. But it, it yet, you know, yet again shows that the cannabinoids, even the synthetic ones we've never heard of, still have a, a lot of intriguing uh, anti-inflammatory properties, and uh, it's wide open for their ability to, to treat all kinds of things in the therapeutic way. Yeah, and it's um, it makes you wonder also just how far behind we are. I mean, we've got some of the uh, uh, research on cannabis and, and cancer and some of these other uh, conditions dating back to the 70s. Uh, University of Virginia, I believe, is one of the places they found this out. And then the government shuts down that sort of research. I mean, uh, how far behind are we, 40, 50 years now? I mean, I, I think 40 years is not an outrageous estimate. And even, you know, the Israelis who, you know, tried to sidestep some of these problems have, have not had the kind of funding the United States has had over those decades. And uh, I think we're going to discover, you know, huh, 10 years down the line, but markedly too late for, for some folks, that uh, the cannabinoid system is central to a whole lot of biological functions and could have prevented a whole lot of disorders uh, across the years. And it, it kind of breaks my heart when I think of the, the folks we've lost in all that time. Yeah, and it, it kind of, you know, if, if you're a student of history, it also kind of brings up 
how these days in America we're hearing a whole lot of, of haterade and, you know, McCarthy-esque kind of uh, rhetoric out there. And just stop to think that it was Harry J. Anslinger saying the darkies would look at white women that has forestalled about 40 years worth of marijuana medical research. It really comes down to it being about hate and discrimination that has retarded the progress that we should have been making uh, up to this point. Well, and the, and the greed behind that was, hey, my, my law enforcement buddies who have been enforcing alcohol prohibition are going to lose their jobs unless I come up with something else for everybody to fear. Yeah, what a shame. You know, and just so fear-based. Now, folks, if you've got a question for Dr. Mitch Earlywine, you can always get it in privately and securely by emailing him at 420research at gmail.com. That's 420research at gmail.com. And uh, one last bit here, uh, just wrapping up from some of the news out there. Uh, Scientific American republished some of this stuff on the uh, the hyperpotent skunk causing problems for the users. A, a quick uh, debunk of that for us, please. It's intriguing because it, it's not randomly assigned, and they actually quote uh, some of my friends, including Meg Haney, who even a couple of years ago was less outspoken about the problems with this kind of work. I, I hope she's uh, become more brave in part because she's got a, a great bunch of funds already secured or something. But as she emphasizes, these aren't randomly assigned. We could have had deviant brain function in all these folks before they ever even touched cannabis. So we want to kind of keep that in mind that this could have been something that actually drew people to the high skunk sort of high THC strains, not necessarily uh, a, a product of it. That said, uh, at least with some of these psychotic symptoms and things like that, uh, the world needs a little more CBD, and I'm not, I'm not afraid to say that even if I do get some nasty emails. Um, the bottom, bottom line is, uh, you know, decades of high THC strains uh, getting bred and crossbred uh, have made me want to emphasize that, hey, uh, a, little, a, little high, a little high will do it. You don't have to have a whole slick on a break uh, just to prove you love the funk. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Mitch, for your insight and your knowledge on these topics. And uh, we'll be off for the next couple of weeks for the holiday breaks. But uh, uh, we'll be back in January with more of our cannabis Q&A. So, Dr. Mitch, happy holidays to you. And we'll talk to you next year. Happy New Year, man. All right. When we come back, we're going to take a look at the stoners against legalization in California. Coming up with reasons why you should keep prohibition. <laughs> Oh, they're reaching this time, folks. This is the Russ Belleville Show on CannabisRadio.com. This is Radical Russ encouraging you to take a look at the Weed Blog every day. Johnny Green and the staff at the Weed Blog are on top of all the latest developments in the fight to end marijuana prohibition nationwide. You can even get the Weed Blog on your smartphone by installing the Weed Blog app for iPhone and Android. If it's about weed, it's on the Weed Blog, including my original writing. So don't delay. Read the Weed Blog today. The Russ Belleville Show, providing dictionaries to drug czars since 2009. Great websites today need expert web design and development and need to be e-commerce ready and mobile friendly. But building a marketable and profitable website can be an uphill climb. Ready to make your new website or replace your existing website? Think Orange as the new way to get in the black. Orange Hill Development works with Fortune 500 companies and offer the same top quality development service at a fraction of what other providers charge. Brands like Absolute, Carlsberg, and Nestle trust Orange Hill Development. Find out why you should trust your website with Orange Hill. Contact Orange Hill for a consultation today at orangehilldevelopment.com. We must wage what I have called total war against public enemy number one. I support a change in law to end federal criminal penalties for possession of up to one ounce of marijuana. That marijuana, pot, grass, whatever you want to call it, is probably the most dangerous drug. Some think there won't be room for them in jail. We'll make them. I experimented with marijuana a time or two, and I didn't like it and didn't inhale. One major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. Entirely legitimate topic uh, for debate. Radical rant. Well, folks, the continuing saga of stoners against legalization continues in the United States and with five states possibly voting on marijuana legalization 
come this next November. The Stoners Against Legalization is going to get very, very, very busy, very thick. Five different states where current pot smokers are going to find a way, they're going to find something in these initiatives that is so egregious, so offensive, that they would rather remain criminals, they would rather subject, subject fellow cannabis consumers to the possibility of losing their kids, losing their stuff, being arrested, being fined, put on probation, losing their job, losing their homes, would rather that we all suffer that possibility, even if it's just as minor as a $100 decrim ticket, we'd rather stay with that than end prohibition, than make marijuana legal, than establish pot shops that all adults can shop at, than to have our product labeled and tested uh, for potency and purity and free from contaminants, to finally put some sort of dent in the criminal trafficking of marijuana and enriching street gangs and Mexican cartels. They'd rather forego all that because they find some little thing, some little molehill within the initiative that they'll blow up into a mountain so that we can continue prohibition another year or two or four. So, Today, we're going to take a look at the California stoners against legalization who have taken to repeating a scare tactic that I heard first back in 2012. Back in 2012, Washington's I-502 stoners against legalization told me that a non-store ounce would be illegal. And the way they had justified that is because, well, you can only possess an ounce, right? But you can't home grow. It's illegal to home grow in Washington state. So if the cops caught you with an ounce in a baggie rather than in a sealed state approved container, that ounce would be illegal and you'd be busted. And I told them time and time again, I-502 legalizes an ounce. It doesn't say it legalizes a store-bought ounce. It legalizes an ounce. But they assured me, nope, if we pass I-502, cops will just bust people because they don't have it in the proper bag. Folks, that turned out to be absolutely false. Nobody in Washington state has been bought, has been uh, busted for possession of a non-store ounce. So, fast forward now to 2015, as we're looking at 2016, the California Adult Use of Marijuana Act, or what some people know as the Sean Parker Initiative, is getting attacked from the cannabis community from that fringe stoners against legalization edge. And my Facebook lights up because I got tagged in this one from a longtime California marijuana activist named Steve Cubby. And this is his post. He writes, the lie being used to sell the Parker initiative. According to Russ Belville and other supporters, the point of the Sean Parker initiative is that by legalizing just one ounce, cops will no longer have any probable cause, based on odor, for searching your car. This is absolutely false. Under the Parker initiative, the presence of an open container of weed is a criminal offense. So cops will know that most people keep their weed in baggies or personal containers, none of which will be legal under Parker. It is an outright lie to tell anyone that marijuana arrests will go down when Parker specifically creates a brand new crime of not having your weed sealed in a state approved container. You could be arrested even if you are not driving and are only a passenger. Well, <laughs> look, I, I respect Steve Cubby, what he's been through, his history, his dedication to activism. But in this and other posts, he is as gravely mistaken as those stoners against legalization from Washington 2012 who also told me transporting a non-store ounce would be a crime. First of all, as to his point, it is an outright lie to tell anyone marijuana arrests will go down. Arrests in all the states that have legalized marijuana have gone down. And not just the less than an ounce bus in Colorado and Washington, and not just the less than six plant bus in Colorado. All marijuana arrests have gone down. In Washington, where they have no home grow, from the Drug Policy Alliance report, quote, all categories of marijuana law violations are down 63% and marijuana-related convictions are down 81%, end quote. 
In other words, two out of three people who would have been busted before didn't get charged, and four out of five people who would have been convicted before didn't get convicted. In Colorado, quote, from the Drug Policy Alliance, quote, the total number of charges filed in court for marijuana possession, distribution, and cultivation in Colorado fell 80.1%, end quote. That's right. Because of legalizing just one ounce and just six plants, four out of five people who would have been charged for any marijuana crime in Colorado didn't get charged. Even in Washington, with no home grow and that hideous per se DUID provision, marijuana arrests went down and DUIDs didn't replace them. California's Adult Use of Marijuana Act legalizes marijuana in a very similar way to the currently legal states and even contains some provisions that improve on legalization, like allowing pot lounges. So it's reasonable to believe their arrests will decline after legalization too. Now, uh, the other point was uh, cops will no longer have probable cause based on odor for searching your car. My contention that the probable cause is based on odor is going away isn't just the observation of reality in the four legal states where they've had to retire pot sniffing canines. Why would you have to retire a pot sniffing canine if the odor of marijuana was still a probable cause? But also, in the actual text of the Adult Use of Marijuana Act, section 11362.1, paragraph C, marijuana and marijuana products involved in any way with conduct deemed lawful by this section are not contraband nor subject to seizure, and no conduct deemed lawful by this section shall constitute the basis for detention, search, or arrest. Now, conduct deemed lawful in this section, but what about that open container that he's complaining about? Now, that indeed is illegal. Section 11... 362.3 paragraph A, nothing in section 11362.1, the one that says there's no probable cause and all, shall be construed to permit any person to possess an open container or open package of marijuana or marijuana products while driving, operating, or riding in the passenger seat or compartment of a motor vehicle, boat, vessel, aircraft, or other vehicle used for transportation. Section 11362.4, paragraph B, a person who engages in the conduct described in paragraphs 2 through 4, which is the paragraph above, shall be guilty of an infraction punishable by no more than a $250 fine. Hmm. Well, maybe that's the language Cubby's using to claim there will be more arrests after legalization as cops bust adult stoners riding in the passenger seat with less than an ounce of weed in a Ziploc baggie rather than the state-approved container. Maybe, maybe that's where it comes from. Now, never mind, how do we end up with more arrests if the punishment's an infraction where you can't arrest somebody and it's just a $250 fine? Remember, Cubby said it creates a brand new crime of not having your weed sealed in a state-approved container. You could be arrested even if you're not driving and are only a passenger. But the punishment here is an infraction punishable by no more than a $250 fine. All right, so it can't possibly be more arrests. Now, maybe open container tickets. But let's focus a moment on that state-approved container part and ask, why does the section say both open container and open package. Well, there's plenty of language in the act that says how marijuana has to be packaged, warning labels, childproof containers, and so on. Maybe that's where you get the idea that open container and open package can only be those purchased at the state licensed weed store, except in the section on commercial definitions, package means any container or receptacle used for holding marijuana or marijuana products. Any container. Now, the marijuana and marijuana products, does that, wait, that, could that be just commercial marijuana and marijuana products? No, because this section also says that marijuana means all parts of the plant cannabis sativa, whether growing or not, the seeds, the resin, every compound, blah, blah, blah. All parts. It doesn't say only the parts that were grown at commercial places or that are at commercial places. It's all marijuana. So any container that holds marijuana can't be limited to just the containers that hold state marijuana because it's lawful for us to cultivate and possess our own marijuana. So consider 
that it's going to be lawful to transport or give away to persons 21 years of age or older without any compensation whatsoever, not more than 28.5 grams of marijuana. I can transport and give away marijuana up to an ounce. It's also lawful for me to cultivate marijuana at home and possess the results of the harvest. So if I lawfully grow some weed and lawfully give away less than an ounce to an adult friend who's lawfully allowed to possess it, he's also lawfully allowed to transport it. How does my friend lawfully transport his gift home other than walking? If a sealed marijuana package from the store is the only lawful closed container. Go further. Take home, grow out of it. I go to the marijuana store and I buy an ounce. It's got a lawful sealed container. I take it home. I open it up. I share half with my friend, which I'm lawfully allowed to do. How does my friend get it home? He's lawfully allowed to transport it. Clearly, the point of this open container law is to bust people who are toking and driving. End of story. And there are eight things listed in this law that you cannot do. Eight paragraphs. Paragraph seven is you can't toke and drive. Paragraph eight is you can't toke in a car as a passenger. And there's the other six. You know, you can't. It's it, still illegal to uh, uh, have it around schools, to give to minors and so on, right? And paragraph four is the illegal open container that you get a $250 ticket for. But the part that has the punishments, okay, so there's a part that has what's illegal, eight different things, but the punishments that go with them only list the first six. There's only punishments for paragraph one through six. No punishment for toking and driving. No punishment for toking in a car as a passenger. So they give you the $250 fine because you've got the weed out of its package the open container. Now, if this is really problematic for you, the solution is don't toke in your car and keep your weed in a sealed container, preferably in the trunk. It's hard to fathom why that's an unacceptable compromise to ending marijuana prohibition unless you're fighting for the right to toke and drive. Now, don't believe the scares that marijuana legalization is somehow worse than continuing prohibition that's been proven wrong in four out of four states so far. No marijuana legalization initiative's perfect. Every marijuana legalization law will have to be adjusted and tweaked. Here in the Pacific Northwest, we're fighting for pot lounges that all the other legal states look like they're gonna get. So there's problems everywhere, but you do not hand a victory to the cops, the rehabs, the drug testers, and the prisons that want to keep us criminal. I'm Radical Russ, until next time. Take care of each other, tokers. This is the Russ Belleville Show. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth.